Hello, everybody. Over the next few minutes, we will discuss why we should continue to use bone scans and CT scans for management decisions in patients with hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Here are my disclosures. Over the next few minutes, I will try to place bone scans and CT scans at the very center of patient care in patients with suspected or known metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer while acknowledging their limitations. I will try to convince you that next-generation imaging should be a problem solver after bone scans and CT scans because next-generation imaging does cloudy patient management and I will try to convince you that we need a higher quality of evidence on management or prognostic impacts of next generation imaging before we can substitute bone scans and CT scans by next generation imaging. Now we should all be very familiar with the clinical disease states model and the hormone sensitive prostate cancers are shown here in the pink outline. We can see that in this clinical disease states model, the presence or absence of metastatic disease and its volume is determined by bone scans and CT scans. And next generation imaging does not exist in the current model. And that's because the presence and the volume and the distribution of metastatic disease is highly prognostic. And because it's highly prognostic, it helps us create risk groups. And it is these risk groups that then determine what therapies patients will have. So let's talk about the central prognostic role of bone scans and CT scans in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. So here's data that was published recently showing you that if you had metastatic disease in the lymph nodes alone, you would survive much better than if you had metastatic disease in the bone. And if you had metastatic disease in the viscera at the start of your metastatic journey, you would have the worst prognosis. And you can see that if you have more than one site of metastatic disease, then your survival is worse than if you only had a single site of disease. So bone scans and CT scans therefore helps us define patients who are at higher and at lower risk. And there are a number of definitions available. One of the most common is the stampede definition because that only relies on bone scans and CT scans. Now, if you use the stampede definition and you look at the prognostic value to a hormonal therapy such as abiraterone, you can see that low volume and high volume disease have different outcomes in the setting of metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, indicating a prognostic role. And we see that there's also a prognostic value of bone scans and CT scans with docetaxel chemotherapy. In fact, it turns out that the prognostic value of bone scans and CT scans is regardless of nodal status, of Gleason score, of age, or even your performance status. But it is not independent of when your primary tumor was treated. So if you have metastatic disease that is synchronous, in other words, at the same time when your cancer is discovered, then your prognosis is going to be worse than if it is metachronous. In other words, sometime after your primary treatment. And in the metachronous state, you can see that people who have lower volume of disease have a better prognosis than people with higher volumes of disease. In other words, in this particular graph, it's the blue line. And it is these patients with low volume metachronous disease who benefit most from next generation imaging. And that's exactly what the ASCO guidelines say. So the ASCO guidelines on advanced prostate cancer state that you can use next generation imaging in the setting where you want to clarify the volume and the distribution of disease if it would affect your therapy choices going from limited therapies such as metastasis directed th therapies to a systemic therapy. In other words, to increase the confidence of using systemic therapies for otherwise low volume metachronous disease. And here's a typical example. So this
man presents with what looks like low volume, low risk metachronous prostate cancer some time after his primary therapy. But you'll notice he's got pain. The presence of pain indicates a more aggressive disease and a poorer prognosis. And these are the very people that would benefit from the use of next generation imaging. So he had a whole body MRI scan, in which case you can see that he's got high volume disease and he's got spinal cord compression, which was then appropriately treated. And he went on to have chemotherapy also. So these are the very patients who would benefit people who look like the metachronous and low volume, but clinical suspicion tells you there's something else going on. So in these patients, next generation imaging is very helpful. So he went from therapeutic options, which could have included ADT alone, or a second generation androgen deprivation treatment alone, to a higher volume, higher risk disease, and he ended up getting docetaxel plus ADT. Next, let's talk about the predictive role of bone scans and CT scans in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer regarding the use of pelvic radiotherapy. Now, when patients present with metastatic disease, if they have low volume disease, you can see that they benefit from having pelvic radiotherapy. If they have higher volumes of disease and bone scans and CT scans, they do not benefit from pelvic radiotherapy. And this is, again, independently predictive of performance status, tumor stage, regional nodal disease, or age. And it is for this reason that the ESMO guidelines in 2000 said that patients with high-risk locally advanced prostate cancer should be staged with bone scans and CT scans because of the pelvic radiotherapy aspect. And patients with apparently localized disease on a bone scan and CT scan should not be denied pelvic radiotherapy solely on the basis of polymetastatic disease that has been seen on a next generation imaging technology. And this is a very important statement. But they did not tell us anything about what to do with patients who had equivocal bone scans. But luckily, the ASCO guidelines do tell us that if you have patients who present with equivocal findings on bone scan and CT scans, then you can use next generation imaging. So bone scan and CT scans first. If you're not sure, then do a next generation imaging technology. And here is an example. So this is a 55 year old man with high risk prostate cancer. He has localized, he has locally advanced disease and he's got a Gleason 9 tumor. So he went on to have a bone scan and CT scan according to the recommendation. And you can see two lesions on the bone scan and both lesions are negative on the CT scan. So does he have bone metastasis? Is this oligometastatic disease or has he got polymetastatic disease here? Can you be sure? Should he have pelvic radiotherapy, which would be indicated for oligometastatic disease, but not for polymetastatic disease. And if you were thinking of just boosting those two regions, are you sure that those are the only lesions that require boosting? You see, this is the indication that the ASCO guidelines say you can use next generation imaging for. And when you do that, what you notice is that the right acetabular lesion is positive on the PSMA PET CT and it's positive on the whole body MRI scan also and ditto the rib. The rib is also positive on the PSMA PET CT and on the whole body MRI, but negative on the CT scan. So we seem to have some clarity on tumor load. You see, bone scans and CT scans show two lesions, three lesions, but the whole body MRI and the PSMA PET CT scan show 10 lesions. So we now know the truth, but do we have any clarity on what we should do with this man? Should we ignore these findings and treat his pelvis, which would have been indicated with bone scans and CT scans, but not with next generation imaging? And afterwards, do we just give him limited ADT or should we use some sort of systemic chemotherapy, for, the, for example? These questions are not clarified by the use of next generation imaging technologies.
And what do you do if a next generation imaging technology, such as a whole body MRI and a PSMA, are discordant? Let me show you an example. So here's a man with intermediate risk prostate cancer. This is a four plus three cancer. He had a bone scan, it's negative. He had a PSMA PET CT, which shows three lesions. Now, if we take the hottest lesion, the one on the right iliac bone, you can see it has a very high SUV. So this would be called positive on the FPSMA, but it's negative on the whole body MRI. Which do you believe? So I don't think we've got clarity on management outcome. So when you look at data like this, the pro-PSMA study, where you see that there's a management change in 28%, do we know whether this is going to translate into a benefit for the patients? I don't think there's enough data to suggest that. And in fact, my clinical colleagues also agree with me. My clinical colleagues are saying that the value of next generation imaging comes when you can show that you maximize treatment benefits, when you minimize under treatments, when you reduce or prevent over treatments, while tempering costs. And next generation imaging always costs more after biases are taken into account. So what are these biases that the clinicians are worried about? Well, we know that next generation imaging detects microscopic metastatic disease, but it also detects micro progressive disease. And this leads to three biases. Number one, stage migration bias, length time bias, and lead time bias. So let's just discuss some of these very briefly. If you use conventional imaging, you would divide patients into metastatic and non-metastatic, and on the right-hand side, you can see what their survivals would be. Now, if you use next-generation imaging, you'll notice that some patients who were false negative on the conventional imaging will become metastatic. Some patients who had indolent disease would also become metastatic. And on the, on the flip side, you've got false positive patients on conventional imaging who will become non-metastatic. So in other words, you've got bi-directional reclassifications due to improved sensitivity and specificity. Now, if you were to use the same treatments, what you would find is that both groups live longer. Why is that? Well, it turns out that the non-metastatic group is a purer group because there are fewer patients in that group with metastatic disease, but the metastatic group also lives longer. And they live longer because you have diluted this group with patients who have indolent or microscopic disease. The other thing you need to remember is that because you started treatments earlier by the detection of microscopic metastatic disease at an earlier time point, you get something called lead time bias. And because you overdiagnose and you overtreat patients with indolent disease, you will get length time bias. So these biases can and do affect survival times. Lastly, I'd like to talk to you about the central role of, of bone scans and CT scans in drug development, particularly with regard to metastasis-free survival in apparently M0 states on conventional imaging and radiographic-free progression. Now, we know that Metastasis-free survival is an approved endpoint for M0 states. So that's to say high-risk localized and locally advanced disease, for high-risk biochemical recurrence, and for high-risk non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. And it turns out that there have been three to four recent drug developments on the basis of the CT and MRI endpoint of metastasis-free survival. Now, if you were to do next generation imaging in these patients, what you would find is that in high risk localized and high risk locally advanced patients, you would find metastatic disease on PSMA PET CT in between 10 to 15% of patients. In high risk biochemical recurrence, you would find metastatic disease in 40% of cases. And with high risk non metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, you would find metastatic disease in about 55% of cases. Are you willing not to give drugs that are approved for these indications because you saw something on a PSMA PET CT when you don't know 
what the long-term impacts are for these interventions. And of course, there are other problems with the use of next generation imaging. For example, its availability and its and our ability to fit it into the therapy pathway. And of course, what you also have to remember is that therapy approvals are linked to bone scans and CT scan assessments and reimbursements for treatment are often not available if you diagnose patients using next generation imaging. We're also unclear whether the treatment decisions that we make will truly benefit patients because that is completely up in the air. And there are, of course, as I've just explained, changes in perspectives regarding the prevalence of disease, its natural history, and the likely response to therapy. So these are all barriers to the use of next generation imaging. So in 2021, we have to say that we need more evidence that next generation imaging really benefits patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And remember the value has to be on top of biomarkers that are already being developed in this space. So finally, I think we have to be careful about the use of next, of next generation imaging in hormone sensitive prostate cancer. Clearly they need imaging, but my view is that they need CT scans and bone scans first, and then we use whole body MRI or, PET, or PSMA PET CT as a problem solver. So one after the other. I don't think we've got enough evidence at the moment for the substitution role of next generation imaging. So here are my final points. We know that bone scans and CT scans are affordable, convenient, there's a skilled uh, user base, although we know there are limitations, and, but we have acceptable workarounds for these patients. We know that there are acceptable surrogates for overall survival in multiple um, advanced prostate cancer states. The reproducibility of these technologies has been shown. As I said to you, therapy uses are linked to the use of bone scans and CT scans. Bone scans and CT scans don't suffer from the confusion of lead time and length time biases. And there are very few indications for the primary use of next generation imaging in hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And when there are, it's usually after the use of bone scans and CT scans. I hope you found some of these comments useful for your clinical practice. Thank you very much for listening.